Good evening, everyone. How are you? It's Julian Gordon, a.k.a. your sidekick in the ass. I'm so glad that you're here for the Be Paid preview call. The program actually starts tomorrow, and I'm here to just give you a brief overview of why I do this work, why having a side hustle is so important at this stage of our lives, this stage of our economy, and what Be Paid is all about and how, hopefully how it can help you. At the end of the call, I'm going to give you a space to ask all of your questions, uh, whether it's just a general question about a side hustle or whether it's about the Be Paid program. And I'm just here this evening uh, to be here for you, to help you get to where you're ultimately trying to go in your life. And I believe that diversifying our income, knowing our true value, knowing our self-worth is one of the best ways to do that. And one of the best ways to exercise that as a vehicle is through a side hustle. Uh, this is the Be Paid shirt. It says, ask me what I do with the SideHustle.com logo. Um, and so I'm actually here at my home in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we've had some good weather over the past few days, but uh, we're expecting some snow soon. I'm supposed to head over to Moorhead State to speak there on Wednesday. So I'm hoping that that snow doesn't keep me here in New York. But I'm so glad to be here with you tonight. We have a lot to cover. Um, some of you have already submitted your questions through the uh, online form. If you have a question and you want to put that to be in the queue, go ahead and enter that question now, and I'll get to that during the Q&A section. Uh, for those of you uh, who see the exercises down below, um, this is a little bit different. Uh, I actually had a technology designed and created uh, that's based on a workbook technology, um, based on my principles of interviewing. My goal is always to bring out the answers that are already within you. I'm not here to just give you information. I'm here to ask the right questions about your life and your business. And that's what my process in terms of how I teach Be Paid. And I'm going to share more about that with you in a moment. So I want to jump right into it. Uh, for those of you who are on the phone, make sure that your phone is on mute. Um, you won't be able to see the slides. You won't be able to see me this evening. Uh, for the rest of you who are actually online at bepaid.me, backslash preview dash call. Again, that's bepaid.me backslash preview dash call. You can actually watch me live here in my home office. Uh, I'm sitting here in sweats just and, and don't even have shoes on. I'm just chilling tonight. Um, but this is how I want to teach you how to make money uh, in between the hours of 5 to 9. Even though it's 9 o'clock right now, I want to teach you how to make more money than you actually make per hour uh, we're using your existing gifts, talents, strengths, and skills from five to nine after work. Because uh, I don't believe that you should stop getting paid when work is over in the same way that I don't believe that you should stop learning once you graduate. This is a constant process of continual development. And I'll tell you more about what Be Paid stands for. A lot of people have a misnomer or a misunderstanding of what Be Paid is really all about. It's not all about making money. It's about actually our personal development, um, our professional development, and our growth. So right now I want to jump into uh, the deck, and you should be able to see that. Again, for those of you who are online at bpay.me backslash a preview dash call, you should be able to see a YouTube link. And on that YouTube link, uh, you should start playing, pressing play, and your video is actually going to be 30 seconds behind the actual audio. They'll be synced for you, but you'll be 30 seconds behind, and um, you should be able to see the slides there. If you want to expand that video, in the lower right-hand corner of the YouTube uh, box, you want to click that square, and you'll be able to get a full screen to see a larger picture of what we're going to do today. So right now, you should see something that says Be Paid Program Preview Call uh, as the home slide. All right? So I'm going to get right into it in terms of why did I create Be Paid. <laughs> and I want to start off with a little story about my first side hustle. My first side hustle uh, was actually started uh, by my mom. She was my uh, initial investor. Uh, see, my mom did everything that she was supposed to. She followed the Cosby life dream, and um, she went on to become an anesthesiologist. And my dad's also a doctor. And they are of a generation where they did everything that they were supposed to. Be good, get good grades, go to school, good school, get a good job, become a teacher, doctor, lawyer, engineer, something like that. And they both became doctors. And... Uh, about 20, 20 years ago, I saw my mom lose her medical license, um, and uh, she lost it because of alcoholism and, uh, and depression. And I know my mom, and <laughs> it wasn't until I got to Stanford that um, I really realized that she wanted to be an artist. 
that was who she really wanted to be. That's who she really was. But she had grown up and she was just doing what she was told and she ended up in a career path that wasn't really fulfilling to her. And that created this space in her life, which I call the greatest depression. And greatest depression is the gap between who we are and uh, who we are. Who, we, who we're being and who we really want to be. It's the gap between who we are and what we end up doing. And if those two things aren't aligned, then we end up feeling depressed no matter how much money we're making, no matter how big our title is, no matter how big our office is, no matter how big our house or our car is, it doesn't matter. If there's a gap between who you are and what you do on a daily basis, it is almost impossible to be fulfilled and nothing you can do can fill that gap. And so. I saw my mother go through this at a uh, at an early age, and um, and uh, you know it's hard to uh, there's no real transferable skills when it comes to anesthesia. That's what <laughs> she was. She was an anesthesiologist. Not too many transferable skills there. Um, of, of, and so she's had difficulty getting back on her feet in terms of her career path. But one thing she did for me early on was she instilled entrepreneurship in me. Um, not the fact, and not to say that she wanted me to be an entrepreneur. Actually, that's the last thing that she wanted me to be. She actually wanted me to take a secure path like her, even though it didn't necessarily work out in that particular situation. My dad had a completely different outcome um, in terms of navigating uh, his career path as an oral surgeon. But one day when I was in junior high school, what she did was she brought me home this jar of nailators, and it was about uh, 100 nailators in this jar. And to be honest, I didn't eat candy like that. And so instead of uh, eating the candy, I actually put it in my backpack and I started taking it to school. And I started selling it before class, after class, and sometimes even during class until one of my teachers caught me. One of my teachers who probably wasn't teaching me anything relevant to the life I'm living today anyways, but uh, that was my first side hustle. You know, each jar cost about $10, 25 cents times 100 equals $25. So on each jar, I was making $15, and I would ask my mom to go re-up. That's what they call it uh, when you're de dealing drugs. They call it re-ing up. And so my mom was actually helping me slang little dish you know uh, that I was actually doing it at school and during class. Um, but that was my first side hustle. That was the first time that I had created what I call economic value. Everybody on this call is a valuable human being, and there's no monetary number that can really capture your value in the world. Your life is important. But uh, there's a difference in terms of being just a valuable person because of your presence and being able to actually capture some of that value in the form of money. And so I want to share with you how to do that um, based on what I've experienced with my own trainings at Stanford, with my own mistakes, building several businesses over the past uh, decade, um, and what I've learned through all kinds of other programs and trainings that I've invested in to continue to develop. And so what is Be Paid? What does Be Paid stand for? I love acronyms, and you'll find that out when you join the program. Some of you already know one of my acronyms, which is DREAM, which is having your desired relationships, employment, and money. But Be Paid, one of the... Uh, acronyms for be paid is that you're going to get a business plan and implementation document. A business plan and implementation document. Now a lot of people, they think they can go to bplans.com, download a Word document from them, and then just cut, copy, and paste their company name into one of those business plans and say, oh, I have the business plan. I have a fundable business plan now. And that's not how business plans work. I raised money before when I started a tech venture when I was at Stanford, and that's not how business plans work. Every business plan is unique. And yes, that might be a backbone for your business plan, but I'm actually through BPAY going to guide you through hundreds of questions, literally hundreds of questions that as you answer them are going to co-create your be paid, which is not only your business plan, which is your vision of what you want to do. Anybody can go create a business plan. The hardest part for people is actually the implementation. And so as you are completing and answering these questions, you're going to get your business plan and an implementation document, uh, which is a list of things you need to do when you get home from work to move your business forward step by step by step. Right? So you're going to have a to-do list and a blueprint for how to grow your unique business, where to go uh, meet customers, what do you need to do to your website, what do you need to do in order to get financing, what is your sales strategy going to be. All of that's going to be laid out for you through the Be Paid program. But what I'm actually most proud of in terms of what Be Paid really stands for is that Be Paid stands for business, professional, and individual development. 
business, professional, and individual development. You see, at the end of the day, when you think about it, for me, what I'm learning is that there are three things that are going to cause you to grow more than anything else in the world. That One of them is marriage. I just got married a year and a half ago, and that is causing me to grow and expand in ways that I couldn't even imagine. When you start to weave your life together with someone else, it's just you have to grow in that particular space. And so marriage is one thing, but not everybody's going to get married. Right? The second thing that causes you to grow um, in a huge way is uh, having kids, parenthood. Right? When you have kids, for those of you out there who have them or thinking about having them, that's going to cause you to grow and expand in ways that you could have never imagined. They say that you can't even get ready for it. And when it comes, you just naturally, uh, not just naturally, but also through effort, have to change your being and who you are and the way you've been navigating the world. And for me, the third thing that uh, I think causes people to grow more than anything else is entrepreneurship, which is taking some sort of idea that I have and trying to manifest it in the world. You know, your company at the end of the day is only going to grow as big as you grow. Your company is going to grow in direct correlation to how much you grow. So this isn't just about being paid in terms of money. This is about you growing in all these different ways from the standpoint of your business, from the standpoint of your career, whether you want to be a full-time entrepreneur or not, and just you growing as a person. As I've been building my business, I've had to um, let go of old versions of myself, old ideas of myself that weren't going to allow my ideas to move forward and grow bigger. And so my business is teaching me to grow. So again, that's marriage, parenthood, and what I think the third thing is is um, is entrepreneurship or having a business and trying to grow it. Uh, and these three things are so important to me because uh, for some of you, you know that when I was uh, 18, I actually got held up at gunpoint for a car that I had. And this was just a near-death uh, experience for me. And, and that was really a wake-up call. I was just finished from my first year at UCLA. I bought a Mercedes-Benz. It was a 1990 190E, uh, and I bought it because both my parents had Mercedes-Benzes, and I hadn't ridden in any other car, so it was the only car that I really knew, and I wanted to show my parents that I was on a path to success like them, and so I bought the same car that they got, and I was trying to show them that by getting the same thing that they had faster than they got them, right? So if they had a nice house by the age of 35, I had to have one by 30. If they had a nice car by the age of 30, then I had to have one by 25, and I got one at 18. And... Two weeks after I bought the car, um, I, I was promoting parties at the time. I was exploring entrepreneurship, and I was out in L.A. promoting this party, and as soon as I parked the car and turned off the headlights, two men jumped into the car in front of me with guns drawn, and all of a sudden, I'm staring down the barrel of a gun. And so that was a huge wake-up call for me. And when I think about my friends who I consider awakened, um, a lot of my friends who I consider to awaken have had tragic things happen to them that have shook them into uh, shook them into life, that have actually woken them up out of out of some sort of sleep or slumber that they had. Um, one of my good friends, uh, several of my good friends have gotten to major car accidents, um, have broken certain uh, have broken their clavicles and collarbones and legs and 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 my hope. My hope in the world is that it doesn't take some sort of tragic thing like this to happen in order for us to wake up and, and start growing, right? Because if we have to wait for those things to happen, then we're just going to be waiting, 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 waiting. And a lot of people face that when it comes to the midlife crisis, and now there's this new thing called the quarter-life crisis that a lot of people are facing. And so my hope is that we don't have to wait for that. My hope is that we can actually create spaces for our own growth. And for me, I use a side hustle and I challenge you to start a side hustle as a vehicle for your own personal, professional, and business growth. That's what really side hustling is all about. Always knowing your economic value, always knowing your value as a human being, and always being in a space of contribution to others. So this is more than about career change. Um, some of you have taken my career change challenge before, and what I found is, well, I love the career change challenge, and um, I'm proud of the program that I created there. One of the things that I noticed is that a lot of people were jumping from the frying pan to the fire. So they were changing jobs, but then after that feeling of newness uh, faded away, similar to dating, when the honeymoon period faded away, they might have a new job with new colleagues, with even a new salary and a new office, etc. But all of a sudden, that 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 fear and that that um 
that dissatisfaction starts creeping back in. So I realized that it was more about just changing careers. This was uh, what people really needed was to um, know their true value. Because what happens is oftentimes people don't feel like they can say no to their employer. And their employer has all the power at that point in time. I can't leave my job right now. I can't do this right now. And whenever it saddens me, whenever I hear somebody say, I can't do something that I want to do. And some of the obstacles that prevent us from having, that uh, cause us to say, I can't, um, are obstacles that we put in our own way, whether that's increasing our cost of living uh, in alignment with our income, which at the end of the day creates no financial freedom, whatever it is, oftentimes the obstacles are obstacles that we put in our way. And I don't want anybody to ever feel helpless. You know, when I was staring down the barrel of that gun, I had no, um, I had no power in that moment. And I was helpless. And I don't want anybody else to ever have to have that feeling. Right? And so that's what this is all about, is having a side hustle um, always makes you feel empowered because you know your value outside the context of a job, whether you, uh, whether you want to be an entrepreneur full-time or whether you just want to always have a plan B. Um, that's why I teach this skill, and I believe that every employee in the world should have it. And um, if you've been to the Be Paid website, bepaid.me, you'll be able to hear some of the amazing stories of people who've gone through Be Paid, which I call Be Paid owners, who have turned their side hustles and their main hustle. You have Akshay there, who, was, who started off with the Career Change Challenge, then he went on to um, take Be Paid, and recently, I think like three months ago, he left his job, uh, his accounting job, and actually has his own firm now. Uh, you have Kathy, who is a second grade teacher, right? She's a second grade teacher, no business skills whatsoever. She and I met out on a farm uh, where we were picking apples and, and pulling weeds in upstate New York when the weather was better. <laughs> and, um, and she said, I have this passion for food. And so what we did was we took her brand for teaching and said, let's just apply that same brand for teaching to for teaching food. And so now she has a company called Tutorial uh, to Table, where she teaches people how to cook healthy dishes in their home. Um, you have Tanisha, who is an MBA, right? You think somebody went to business school, they know everything there is to know about business. Well, there's a lot of things that an MBA doesn't teach you about business. An MBA is a master's in business administration. It's not a master's in entrepreneurship. It's not a master's in value creation. Managing people um, and managers oftentimes are there to take the risk out of a business, whereas entrepreneurs are people who are willing to uh, take risks. Now, here's the thing that I want to tell you about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs aren't just risk-loving people. Right? Entrepreneurs actually hate risk. A lot of the branding out there is that entrepreneurs are risk lovers. No, an entrepreneur um, is willing to take a risk, but as soon as they take the risk, their goal is to suck all the risk out of the business. That's how you create a successful business is you take a risk and you don't let that perceived risk that's ahead of you stop you from moving forward on an opportunity. But once you actually commit to it, your goal is to take all the risk out of the business. A successful business is one that has certainty in terms of cash flow and growth. And so that's what entrepreneurs uh, are all about. It's about creating value. It's about taking what you already have and making that even better. And I'm going to show you the six forms of capital that you actually have in a second. Now, Recently, I got what I call one of the best testimonials ever. You, you oftentimes hear testimonials, right? I got a testimonial literally uh, last Friday from somebody who took Be Paid in the last cycle. And this is probably my greatest success story to date. And you can see that uh, this young woman, she's actually not a side hustler. She's stepping into entrepreneurship for herself for the first time ever. Uh, she just closed a deal with her first client. For I think she said 13 teachers. She's a recruiter, uh, nonprofit recruiter. She closed a deal for 13 teachers at $2,500 per teacher, with a $2,000 $2,000 bonus per teacher if they move into a leadership role in a couple of years. So at the bare minimum, if she gets all of those teachers, she's making $32,000 off of her first client. <laughs> Now, this is ridiculous. But I didn't even start off like this. My first client was like $1,000 for a speaking gig, and now it's, it's way above that, right? But she closed her first deal for uh, $32,000, and um, if 13 times 5, if she gets that bonus, um, then she's going to be at a $65,000 deal for her first client. And this is from going through BPAY, 
branding herself and positioning herself in the proper way and, and, and knocking it out using her existing social capital and intellectual capital. So I'm so proud of her for making this move and, and I want to teach people how to continue to do this um, in their lives. So I think Jay-Z said it best. Uh, in Diamonds Are Forever remakes where he said, I'm not a business man, I'm a business man, right? So we aren't just people with jobs, right? The reason I do this work is, and part of it is about job creation. We're in one of the worst economic environments that we've ever been in. And a lot of people out there are just job havers, right? They're thankful to have a job. I'm, I'm so happy I have a job, even when I hate it, I'm just happy to have one. Right? That's a job haver, and usually they're not creating the most value possible. The only way that our economy and our companies can succeed is when employees create more value than they take. If employees are taking more value than they're creating, then that's what leads us to an economic environment like we're in today. And I'm not saying that's any of you on this call. I can tell that you're value creators. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But at the end of the day, we have to create more value than we take. And so instead of being a job haver, I want you to think of yourself as a job creator. Yes, oftentimes only entrepreneurs get considered as job creators, right? But employees are the ones who create jobs. They're the ones who do the amazing work inside the companies that actually grow the companies, which actually create jobs. Did an entrepreneur take the risk, like I talked about earlier, and get the company started? Yes. But at the end of the day, employees are job creators. And if you go to work every single day with the idea that you are a job creator, it'll change the way you show up. Now. When I looked at the top 10 hustlers, I did some research amongst all of you, and some of you took this survey, and uh, I asked who are the top 10 hustlers out there. And the top 10 hustlers were Oprah, Jay-Z, Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, Beyonce, Warren Buffett, Diddy, Mark Zuckerberg, Russell Simmons, and Mark Cuban. And you'll notice some things uh, about all of these people with the exception of Mark Zuckerberg. With the exception of Mark Zuckerberg, all of these people, one, make money in multiple ways. None of them make money in just one way, right? And the second thing you'll notice about all of these people is that their personal brands are just as big or bigger than their company's brands. Their personal brands are just as big or bigger than their company's brands, right? So I knew about Warren Buffett before I knew about Berkshire Hathaway, right? I actually knew about Richard Branson before I knew about Virgin anything, okay? And so oftentimes what we tend to do is we tend to hide behind big brands. We went and got a job at this particular company, or we went to this kind of school and try to associate ourselves with these big brands. And it's cool to be associated with big brands. I'm associated with some big brands myself, but I don't lead with those, right? What I lead is with myself, and I use those as my backbones to support who I am, right? But oftentimes when we're hiding behind big brands, then our light never gets to shine because we're putting these other brands in front of ourselves. But when you look at the top 10 hustlers here, none of them do that. They do the exact opposite. They put their personal brand first. Now, uh, there was some research done on uh, the world's billionaires, and I guess there's 1,426 billionaires in the world. And what you'll see at the bottom is something unique. Do you try many ideas, or do you go for one big idea? And at the bottom, you'll see that 830 uh, billionaires actually have multiple businesses, and only 130 of them have one business. Right? And so when we're thinking about our lives, if we're modeling ourselves, if, if those of you out there who money is one of your success metrics on your dashboard, it's going to come through multiple businesses, not just one source. And also on top of that, the path is very circuitous. Um, you know, I started off, uh, I started off with um, my now later's business, and then I was one of the first in high school to invest in a CD burner and so I started selling mixtapes at high school and then I told you in college I was promoting parties and then I started a clothing company then I started a media company then I started a web-based company then I started uh, my college speaking company and now I'm into information products etc so you see I'm going through all of these different avenues really trying to find out where I'm able to create the most value and when you look at all the entrepreneurs out there that we respect many of them have had similar circuitous path so you may have an idea that you want to use and and look at through the lens of be paid but know that that idea may not be the final idea but here's what I like to say as long as you are failing forward as long as you are failing forward, that's the goal. I mean, when I look back on some of my old ideas, I felt like they were failures. 
But at the end of the day, I was failing forward. And if I hadn't done them, I wouldn't be here in front of you today. So the way I define a hustler is, is some, anyone who uses their unique gifts, talents, strengths, and skills to create and capture value in the world through who they are and what they do. Anyone who uses their unique gifts, talents, strengths, and skills to create and capture value in the world through who they are and what they do. And so I want to look at hustler in a different way. So why is this work so important right now? Why is it so important that we think about side hustles right now? Well, we're in one of the toughest economies uh, ever. Um, second to the Great Depression almost, right? And so I want you to look at yourself like a business. And oftentimes we look, we do this kind of work for our companies in terms of financial ana analysis, but we don't do it for our own lives. And so a company has an income statement and a balance sheet. And your income statement is simply your revenues minus your expenses at its, at its base, right? And what I see in the economy and the statistics show that uh, wages are being depressed for employees. Whereas people on the top of the companies and corporations are taking more and more share of the profits, wages for employees are being depressed and they've been going down for several years. So our revenues are going down collectively. On top of that, expenses are going up. Food, education, housing, health care, all those things are on the rise. So here we have our revenues going down and our expenses going up. You may go to the grocery store and buy the same exact things, but guess what? The container is 20% smaller and you didn't even know it, right? So that makes food more expensive. You're paying the same for a smaller amount of something, right? The balance sheet. Balance sheet is your assets minus your liabilities. The same person in our shoes 20 years uh, earlier than us would have had 68% more assets than us at, the, at this time. And a lot of that has to do with the student debt that a lot of us have incurred by going to college, doing what we're supposed to, uh, which is great, but the cost of college has just been rising. In terms of a cost of college has risen uh, 12 times um, 12 times inflation, right? So it's just growing ridiculously, and there's really no cap to it. On top of that, our liabilities are on the rise in terms of housing, mortgages, our college, our student debt. We call it good good debt, but I don't really think any debt is really that good unless it's allowing you to grow your business. So this is why this work is so important. And in one of the earlier modules of be paid, we look at your financial, look at your financials, right? We don't just see what's in your checking savings account. We actually look at your cash flow and your income statement because that's the actual most important number to know. And so this is what the side hustle logo looks like, um, and this is what it means. It means that the economy, which is the sideway S, is going to go up and down, whether you like it or not. That's just what economies do. Economies go in cycles, right? And your main hustle, your job, is on the bottom, and it, it's going to keep you just above water. But your side hustle is what allows you to flourish, um, even in the midst of downturns in the economy, because you know how to create money essentially by creating value for others first uh, even in tough times. And so one of my core beliefs is that we are all already entrepreneurs whether we accept it or not. We are all already entrepreneurs. An employee is an entrepreneur whose biggest and only client is their employer. Okay? So if you just look at yourself and say I'm an entrepreneur and right now I have one big client and that's my job. And guess what? What if that client left you tomorrow? What if that client was like, uh, we're done working with you tomorrow? What would happen to your life? Your life would probably go south pretty quickly. right? You could try to get out there in the job market again, but the average time to find a new job, even with great relationships, could be six months or more. right? And so we are all already entrepreneurs, whether we accept it or not, uh, but our employer is just our biggest client, but it doesn't have to be. It does not have to be. Last year, um, in 2013, I got paid over four figures by 60 different clients. So when you ask yourself, who's more secure? Someone who's getting paid $150,000 by one entity, one client, or someone who's getting paid $10,000 from 12 clients? Who's more secure at the end of the day, right? So that's something to think about. So for me, the way I think about career is a career it means creating, I told you I like acronyms, right? <laughs> career is creating amazing results, even entrepreneurs respect, right? A career is creating amazing results, even entrepreneurs respect, even if that's not what you ultimately want to do, okay? A full time. So the way I think about it is that we are members of the incomes generation. It's dangerous to only have one source of income no matter how much you get paid. 
we are, whereas our parents, they got income from one particular space, right? They got income from one job, and then they try to diversify that in stocks, right? Stocks that they had no control over, which is essentially gambling. If you ask your parents right now, who's controlling your money and your investments? They couldn't give you a name. They'll say Charles Schwab, right? <laughs> they can't even give you a name. And so is that really safe? That's really gambling. So for our generation, what, the way we're actually approaching it, we're actually going to find our security in having multiple streams of income and not trying to diversify it through uncertain means like the stock market. So what I want for you at the end of the day is for your life to look like this, where you have your main hustle, which may be your job, right? And then perhaps you have a rental property. Uh, Pam and I just bought a home um, uh, last May, and it's a three-family home in Brooklyn. And essentially, the second and third floor pay for everything, right? The third floor is Airbnb right now, as long as the laws uh, align for us on that. But that could change at any moment. And then we have some NYU students on the second floor, and that essentially pays for itself. So now our home is actually an asset. Homes aren't always assets. I know we've been taught that our home is an asset. It's always a good thing to do, but an asset is something that pays you. And a mortgage is not something that pays you, or a mortgage is something that takes money out of your pocket. So we have to rethink those things. A lot of people say, oh, I'm a homeowner. No, you're not a homeowner. You're a home buyer. You won't be a homeowner until you've actually paid off the mortgage. So we've been using our language very loosely when it comes to thinking about our money and these ideas around the American dream. And we need to be very careful. And when we start to look at our lives through the lens of entrepreneurship, we say, you know what? That's not actually a positive thing yet. Over time, it might become a positive thing. But right now, I'm not going to count that as a plus. All right? And then in addition to perhaps a rental property, your, uh, your main hustle, I want you to have another four-figure client here, another four-figure client here, another, uh, another um, a few hundred dollar client here and there, which actually gives you more security. So I just want to give you some statistics really quickly about the, what I call the side economy or the, uh, the five to nine economy. My research shows that 52% of people already have a side hustle that is making money consistently, occasionally, or break even. So are you on, are you on the 48% side or are you on the 52% side? 42% have a full-time job that's not long-term for them. 26% uh, say that it is long-term. So they want to have a side hustle, not just uh, not to quit their job, but to keep going forward. 40% have a side hustle that is not related at all to their job. 40% of people have one that's somewhat related, and 20% of people have one that's directly related to their current job. And then 27% of side hustle, uh, hustle for entrepreneurship, 31% just to sharpen their skills, and 20% for extra income. So one of the challenges that people tend to have in terms of their side hustle is that I don't have a good enough idea, right? I don't have a good enough idea, and that's where a lot of people stop. Um, and I, I get good ideas, but I don't know how to turn that idea into a business, right? There's a difference between a good, great idea and a great business, and I want to help you create a great business. So how do you define an idea? The ideas that are going to work for you, that you're going to be able to create value on, usually they are going to be around you. They're probably nearby. Uh, it has to do with your passion, a problem, something that makes you mad or sad when you see it, hear it, or experience it, or a product or service that you've actually earned profit from before. So just ask yourself, what have you been paid for in the past? And did you enjoy that particular activity whatsoever? And for some of you, you might have to go back to junior high school like I did, right, selling candy. Another way to think about it is to pick one skill or pick a bill, right? Skills are easier to monetize than products. Ultimately, I do want you all to have products in the same way that Be Paid is a product. I have books. I have DVDs, et cetera. Those are products because I don't want your business to all be dependent on your time. The thing about skills is that, one, there's no startup costs. You just go. There's no website. It's just your success stories and your results speak for themselves. No inventory, just your brain. No overhead, just lifelong learning. No advertising, just relationships that you already have and that you can grow. No scale, you just need a few customers to bring in uh, four figures a month. No shipping, all you need is the internet to communicate to other clients. And no commoditization, right? Nobody's going to create the exact same skill. There may be people who are in the same space as you, but nobody can replicate you. So all you do is have healthy competition instead of commoditization, which happens um, when you have a product. So I want you to pick a skill or you pick a bill. 
So how do you turn a skill into dollar bills? Um, I think Jay-Z is a good example. Uh, Jay-Z took his skill for rapping, first and foremost, right? That was his that was his entry, and that's what I'm going to help you all do is, is start with your entry. But from the, And that gives you a service line, right? And he made money via concerts. From there, you have products, right? CDs, Rockware, S. Carter shoes, headphones, which I'm actually wearing Skull Candy headphones, which are Rock Nation headphones as well. Um, champagne, uh, he did work with Bing, Budweiser, Coca-Cola, etc. These are products, right? In terms of property, he has physical. He has been in, invested in physical properties: Barclays, J Hotels, Forty Forty Club, Spotted Pig. Intellectual property: his music masters, ghostwriting for others, Fela, Decoded Book. People, right? How did he make money off of people? Not in a McDonald's type of way, where he makes thirty dollars off of them and pays them five dollars an hour. But through Rock Nation um, and Rock Nation Sports, he he does work with people like Rihanna, Shakira, M.I.A., J Cole, etc. And when he's able to get some sort of sponsorship deal for them, um, he is able to get a cut of that, right? So he's working with people. And then finally, a process. You can make money off of a process. Um, and his process is, is manifested in translation advertising, which takes the processes that he's used to get all of these uh, sponsorship deals and uses that for other clients. So these are the four different ways that you can make money beyond just your skills. And ultimately, this is what we're going to build. So what do you focus on when it comes to be paid? Um, you can focus on your entire side hustle as a whole. You can focus on one service line in your side hustle. You can focus, or, or you can focus on a product. All right. So when you're thinking about that, you, you don't have to come to be paid and you do your entire business. You can specifically take one aspect of your business, like one person who's already signed up for be paid. She's specifically focusing on her book. Her book is coming out this year, and she wants to create a business model specifically around her book, which is a big enough deal. Right? She has a full-time job. She's actually executive director of a nonprofit, and so, um, but she wants to make a, a substantial amount of money um, and spread the message that is in her book. Right? The other thing you can do is pick a bill. And picking a bill, what that looks like is saying, okay, what are all my bills? I have my mortgage, I have my rent, I have my car note, insurance, gas, my cell phone, food bill, etc. Pick one bill, right? And let's say you pick a bill like uh, your car note, and that's five hundred dollars a month when you talk about the insurance and everything. You say, what kind of business can I create that's going to bring in $500 a month on the side? right? Just pick one bill and focus on it so that it's taken care of. That's only $6,000 a year. That's not a lot. Like I got one licensing deal th this past year that covers my cell phone bill. And cell phone bill is not a lot. Cell phone bill is about $180 a month. But I got a licensing deal that covers that forever, pretty much, right? until they stop to deal with me. And so what I want to do is help you think about what's one bill that I can actually create a business around um, and move towards that. Now I was going to do the skills inventory with you, um, but we're actually short on time. Um, I can see that the clock is ticking and I want to open up space for questions. But I do want to guide you through uh, the time value exercise. So you should have got a WordPress um, a login, a username and login in your confirmation email. And if you didn't get one, um, I want you to uh, click on the link under the video. And I'm actually going to go there now. I'm changing the screen. It's going to go there now. I want you to click here where it says click here for a free trial login. And the registration form for the call is going to come up. And from there, you can put in your information. That will send you an email. But you should have got a login. And I want you all to log in. And to log in to our website, you just go to bpay.me backslash wp dash login dot php. And I'll, again, all of that was in the email. wp dash login dot php. And once you're logged in, you're going to be able to experience a little bit of what bpaid is all about and how we're actually going to work with each other on the Tuesday and Thursday night calls. So once you're logged in, I want you to scroll down. Um, on this page and click on my current time value. Click on that gray tab. My current time value. And I want you to put in your current time value right now. Uh, I want you to calculate it. Now, note, do not use commas when you're using the online workbook for calculations. So first off, put in your annual salary. What is it right now? And if you want to, you can add your benefits if you know what that adds up to. Put in your annual salary. That's the first thing. 
And the next box, I want you to put in 52, which is the number of weeks per year. That's not going to change. Then put the number of vacation weeks that you have per year. Some people have two. I know we have teachers in the program. They have 12, right? Um, and even 13 if you add Christmas and their spring break and or whatnot, right? Then, um, and then at the bottom where it says work hours per week, put in how many hours you're actually working per week. I know it's assumed that we all work 40 hours a week, but I know some of you out there are working 50, some of you working 60, some of you working 80, right? And when we're working in salary, salary jobs, um, the more you work beyond 40, <laughs> it's not benefiting you, right? <laughs> some of you working on weekends, you got Blackberries and iPhones that are connected to your hip, right? Can't even be fully present with the family. So once you're done with that, I want you to hit calculate. And that's going to refresh the entire page. Give it a moment because there's quite a few people um, here this evening. Give it a moment. All right, great. And so that should give you a number in terms of dollars per hour that you're actually earning right now, all right? Dollars per hour. In this example that I have here, it's $50 per hour. If you're just joining us, um, please go to bpay.me backslash preview dash call. Again, that's bpay.me backslash preview dash call. And, um, and that's where you will be able to follow along. Click play on the YouTube video that you see there, and that will allow you to uh, follow along. Okay? So now we have your dollars per hour. And for some of you, um, it's pretty low. And basically, if you're working a 40-hour work week, 50 hours a week, that's 2,000 hours per year. Um, and you can just take your dollars per hour, so let's say you have $30 per hour, and multiply that by 2000 and you basically get $60,000 a year. So whatever you're making per hour, you multiply that by 2000 and that's basically your annual salary. Okay? So now I want you to do the same exercise. I want you to click on the, uh, the tab that says My Desired Time Value. Okay? And the ones on the right under Desired Time Value are going to be blank. And I want you to fill in the numbers there. Start with your desired annual salary. Put in 52 for the weeks of the year. Put in how many vacation weeks you actually want. Put how many hours you want to work per week. You don't have to work a 40-hour week. All right? And once you're done with that, hit Calculate. And you can see in this example, if this person wants to make half a million dollars per year and they want to have four weeks of vacation and they only want to work 30 hours a week, then they need to be able to earn $347 per hour, right? So if somebody wants to earn $347 per hour in order to have this particular life and this annual salary, then guess what? That's just what they take. They have to be able to figure out how am I going to create $500 worth of value for somebody through a skill or service that I offer that's going to allow me to capture 347 of it, right? You don't just get to capture all of the value. You have to say, if I want to get paid this, I have to create probably five times as much value for someone who's going to pay me in order to get that, right? With be paid, there's a price point on it. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to create five times that value for you so that it becomes a no-brainer when you think about making the investment. Right? That's that's the goal, and that's how you have to think about your value. You don't just get uh, you don't just get to keep all the value that you created. You create value, you create as much value as you can for somebody, and then from there uh, you take home some of it. Okay. So I want to get back into the slides now. So that's the time value exercise. So so now you know what you need to earn in order to have the life that you ultimately want. All right. So the next thing is challenge number two. I don't have enough time. Okay. I don't have enough time. This is the biggest thing um, that side hustlers uh, have a challenge with. And the way I think about it, it's like running a marathon. I'm sure you have people in your office who run marathons, and you're like, how do they run marathons? In order to do that, they have to wake up early and train. They might run during lunch. They might run after work, and then they're running on weekends. Right? They're making time to run these races. And one thing that drives them is actually having uh, one thing that drives them is having um, uh, an event 
a future event and I'll teach you some goal setting strategies that actually get you and move you into action. All right? um, you know, your friends at work might run a marathon but what you're doing is running a business and I know some of you have guilt around uh, getting paid um, in another way beyond just your job and it's almost taboo or or you're shy about talking about your side hustle at the end of the day and the question is does your employer, employer have a lifelong contract with you? No, they don't. There's only like two employers in the entire world that have lifelong contracts um, and so if that's the case then you shouldn't be ashamed of making money in other ways. If somebody's running a marathon and spending their time doing that, it, guess what? You're, you're running a business. There's no difference, right? There's no difference. And the thing about it is that companies have side hustles too. Originally, Apple was a computer company, right? And then they found this side hustle called an iPhone, right? And that thing grew. And then they found another side hustle called an iPad, and that thing grew. And now the iPhone and the iPad make more money for them than their computers. And so even companies have side hustles. You even look at Google. Google's main business, its core business was search. But Google is always searching for what's next, <laughs> no pun intended. And that's how you get Gmail, Google Maps, YouTube, etc. Right? These are new innovations. These are side hustles that major companies have. So if companies have side hustles, then it's okay for us to have side hustles too. So here are some options that you have um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of thinking about your work. So the options in terms of making time and space. One, the compressed work week. The compressed work week, it means that you work four days a week for 10 hours a day. Still 40 hours, right? And so a lot of times people think when they think of the compressed work week is I'm going to work Monday through Thursday from 8 to uh, eight to 7, right? Or 7 to 7, right? With a lunch break. And um, the way I think about the compressed work week, which I think is actually better, is can I work Monday and Tuesday for 10 hours, take, a, take Wednesday off, and then come back strong on Thursday and Friday and then have a two-day weekend. To me, that would be the best ideal um, compressed work week. The other thing is telecommuting. I know that when I lived in LA, I spent about six hours a week uh, in traffic just trying to get from home, which was only 15 minutes away when there was no traffic. And so some days you might be able to telecommute. That's going to create time and space in your life right, to work on your side hustle by reducing your travel time. Early start, early depart. Um, early start to early depart means uh, going to work from 6 to six to 3. Um, when I was working at my first job out of business school, after demonstrating that I was a high performer, I switched my time from 8 to 5, like everybody else, to 6 to 3. So I got to the office. Um, one, I'm traveling when there's no traffic, right? So I get to work faster. And then two, um, I'm working from 6 to 8. Nobody else is there, so nobody's bothering me. Guess what? I'm more productive. <laughs> Then I get and leave at three, get home, rest, eat a little food, um, take a nap, get back up. It's five o'clock. Everybody else is sluggish and getting off of work, and I'm re-energized. And I feel like I have a second day ahead of me. That's early start, early depart. Taking full advantage of your vacation and sick days. I talked to a friend the other day who's in transition and starting his company, and he was like, you know what? I didn't take any of my vacation days whatsoever. I just wasted them. Those are opportunities to work on your side hustle, to go to a client site, to actually work with them, to have calls, to, to, do, to do work, right? Your vacation and sick days. If you haven't been using them to actually go travel, then you can use them for your side hustle. Um, you might want to reduce your number of hours to 35 hours. If you find that your job is only paying you $30 an hour, but through your side hustle you can actually earn $100 or $200 an hour, then it would make sense to reduce your hours there slowly but surely to, to even a point where you get down to half. And now your side hustle becomes your main hustle and your job is now your side hustle. Other thing is using your lunch breaks. When you, when you register or be paid, um, I'm going to ask you to listen to the audio during your commute to work and from work and during your lunch break. Some of you don't take lunch. Lunch break is there. Use it. To get out of the office. Don't sit at a computer. There's always going to be more work. And then the other thing is results-only work environment. That's called ROW. Um, that means that it's not based on how much time you're at your desk. Uh, it's based on uh, your results. And if you are a high performer, you can negotiate these kind of changes in your employment agreements. Options you have before work. Wake up uh, an hour earlier. Right, daylight savings time is coming. I'm not sure if it's going to help us or hurt us in terms of waking up an hour earlier. Um, somebody can tell me during the Q&A. Uh, 
you can work at work before work. Okay, so let's say you get to work early, you get to work at seven, um, and you use seven to eight as your side hustle time, and then eight o'clock, and everybody else starts coming in. You start doing the work for your employer, right? One, it looks like you got there early, <laughs> and that you were grinding for them when you were actually working on your side hustle. Um, and, but you worked at work before work. Go to Starbucks in the morning. Don't just go get your coffee. Go do some work on your side hustle and use public transportation. Instead of you driving and being behind the wheel and having to focus, you can actually use public transportation and use that time and have it scheduled in your day because you have to get home and to work uh, to work on your side hustle. Options after work. Go to Starbucks or the library. Work at work after work. Again, it looks like you're working harder and longer <laughs> when you're actually working on what you need to work on. As long as you're not using company resources like their pens, their paper, their printer, don't use that. You can, but you can be at your desk. You're using a little bit of power for your computer, but that's it. And then meet another side hustler. Right After work, go meet another side hustler so you're not on this journey alone. And then finally, the, the last thing is that people have is I don't have enough money. And if you don't have enough money uh, to start your side hustle, then that's probably the number one reason why you need a side hustle. Because something's not going right in terms of the way you're running the business of your life if you don't have enough money. You're not creating or capturing uh, the value that you truly deserve and that you're capable of doing. And so I want to introduce you to the other six forms of capital, uh, all the six forms of capital, financial capital being uh, one of them. And those are your personal capital, your intellectual capital, your social capital, your human capital, physical capital, and financial capital. And the thing about it is when you have a business, you have two forms of capital that an individual doesn't have. And that's human capital and physical capital. And I'm going to talk about those. Your personal capital is how well you know yourself. So this is all really about your strengths, right? And oftentimes only we are fully aware of our strengths, or sometimes we're not. Sometimes other people see our strengths in us, right? But this is our personal capital, and this is what we can bring to the table. Our intellectual capital is our skills and our subject mastery. A skill is the ability to move an individual organization or object from some sort of point A to some sort of point B. Okay, This is your intellectual capital. Yes, you might have went to a good school and had a particular major there, but if I ask you to lecture for one hour on whatever that major is, could you do it? Right, Your skill or your subject mastery is that thing that you can stand in front of people and actually teach for an extended period of time. Your social capital is who you know and who knows you. This is your uh, networks up, down, across, and out. Right? Most of us only have networks in our cell phones amongst our peer groups, our Facebook friends. But the most powerful form of networking that you can start doing right now is networking up. When I think about my business, the people who have actually opened the doors are in my network up. And so we want to change the nature of our relationships and, and how we invest our time meeting people. Now, two other forms of capital that you have as an entrepreneur are human capital, meaning that you hire people. Right? I use Fiverr.com all the time. I have tons of contractors from my videographer to my web designer to my lawyer to my accountant, etc. I have human capital. Right? I'm not doing everything that you see here. And so you actually can use that to your advantage to even have somebody work, working for you while you're working at your main hustle. And then there's physical capital. Physical capital is equipment that you have access to. You know, if you're a videographer, a videographer who has their own camera and lights and studio might have an advantage over someone who doesn't, right? A videographer who has to go rent all of that equipment. And then finally, there's your financial capital, which is who knows that you know what you know. Financial capital comes at the intersection of your intellectual capital and your social capital, right? And so the reason I get paid to speak at different conferences, companies, and colleges all across the country is because the right people at those organizations, my social capital, know that I know a lot about helping uh, people maximize their resources and be entrepreneurial in any environment, and that's my intellectual capital. And when those two things intersect, financial opportunities flow. All right? And so that in synopsis is why I th think this work is so important. And inside Be Paid is uh, the nine side steps. And the nine side steps include finding your why, finding the courage to start, finding time and flow, finding your idea of market, finding a business model, finding your brand and positioning, finding and selling clients, finding the right tools and technology, and then finding and managing money. And you can see most of the content on the actual homepage um, for Be Paid. So I'm going to skip through some of this because uh, I want to get to Q&A. But th the question that I want to really uh, leave you with and I want you to always think about is, and I'm actually going to um, jump out of the deck for this. 
The question I want to leave you with is basically, if I gave you a dollar today, or just say I gave you a hundred dollars, right? If I gave you this hundred dollars today, could you turn this into a hundred and ten dollars 365 days from now? Right? Could you turn this to a hundred and ten dollars 365 days? I gave you 365 days to turn this to a hundred and ten dollars. Could you do it? Yeah, you could. You might have heard of the parable of the talents, right? There's one guy or one person who got their talents and um, they went and multiplied them. Then another guy got fewer talents, but he went and multiplied his. Then one person got their talents, and in order not to lose their talents, they put them in the ground and buried them. And when it was time to return to the person who gave them the talents in the first place, all they had was their existing talents, and they hadn't expanded them or grown them in any way. And when we think about some of the other passive forms of investment, like uh, the bank accounts, your savings account. If you have any money in your savings account, basically you are losing money because uh, inflation is growing faster than your the interest rate on your savings account. Homes have only grown at 3.7 percent per year. Right? The average stock market has only uh, grown at 6.8 percent per year over the uh, past 10 years. And I just ask you, could you turn this hundred dollars into 110 dollars over the course of the year? If you said yes to that. That's a 10% return. And so if I could invest, if all of you had companies and I could invest in you instead of having any money in the bank account, I would invest in you because I would get a greater return from you than these other passive forms of investment that we just cross our fingers and that are hope-based instead of hustle-based. Right? So with that, uh, I want to open it up for questions uh, about the program, about anything that I shared. Uh, the program starts tomorrow night. Um, and uh, and it starts at 9 p.m. And it's going to be just like this. Uh, we are going to, you're going to get an audio file as soon as you register and you listen to that. That's module one. And then on the call, we actually go through the online workbook. So today we use the online workbook and we did your time value exercise. But on the calls, we do about six different exercises per module to start co-creating your be paid, which is your business plan and implementation document. And we do that over a course of three weeks, right? So there's six calls. Um, they're usually going to be an hour. They could go a little bit longer, and I'm willing to stay and be there for anybody who's ready to show up for themselves. In between calls, there's full email support. Um, I'm asking questions, answering questions um, in our secret or private Facebook group where you'll get to meet and connect with all the other be paid members. If you need feedback on a website or a design or a logo, uh, they are there to support. Um, and I've tried to simplify the program. The last cycle, what used to happen was um, people would come on the calls and I would do all the teaching and then they would go off and do the assignments on their own. And this time I've actually reversed the classroom. Right? So instead, this time, I'm doing the passive stuff, which is listening to the teaching uh, during your commute or your lunch break, and then I'm actually going to be there to walk you through the difficult stuff, which is answering these questions that I'm asking you about how to grow your business and your side hustle on the side. All right? So what I want to do now is I want to open it up for questions. If you are on the telephone line, um, in order to unmute yourself, all you have to do is press star five, um, and I'll take a question from there. And uh, and I also got some questions online already, and I'll start there uh, right now. You can also use the form that is on the web page. So um, let me see. Uh, James said, "I am a youth speaker, and I need uh, and I know I need to design a business that I'm having, but I'm having a hard time with." The business aspect. What are some steps for growing a speaking business while I have a full-time job, and how do I get organized? So, James, um, this is a great question. I'm sure you have a gift for speaking, uh, and uh, it's one thing to have your idea and your core presentation, but then there's the underlying business of it, and that's what BPay will help you do, and we'll work through that. I actually have a blog post that I'm going to send you directly on how to grow a speaking business. This is outside of the BPay program. This is something that I'm just going to give you uh, in terms of how I built my speaking business. A lot of people ask me this exact same question, and one day I just documented as much as I could. Um, but in terms of the underlying business infrastructure of a speaking business, I'm getting better at it right now. 
and um, and it's constantly getting refined. So I'm still learning how to build a profitable speaking business. Um, my speaking business has grown. One thing that's really helped me is my TED Talk. Uh, I just went to a conference in San Diego uh, where I invested in a booth and to do a session, an educational session, and um, I invested a few thousand dollars to go to that conference. Right? I had to buy my hotel, I had to pay for the booth, I had to pay for registration, I had to send DVDs, I had to send books there, all that, I invested in that. Right, And while I'm at the booth, I'm collecting um, schools information. And at that conference, I, made, uh, I met about 200 people from different schools. And so now I'm in the process of following up with all those schools in hopes that I get a return on my investment, not even in hopes. If I'm able to close a deal with two schools, then I paid for the trip. And if I'm able to close deals with more than two schools, then all of a sudden um, I'm in the black and I'm profiting off of that particular experience. So that's just a short answer to your question uh, for now. I hope that helps. Uh, uh, I think Ofa, Ofum said, Julian, I'm a construction professional. I have the ambition to use those skills in an entrepreneurial way. The challenge I have is not being technically ready to provide those skills. I need about five more years of solid training and experience. I learned this when I worked as a consultant between 2010 and 2012. I'm recently unemployed and I decided to target the companies below as my employers to fill the gap between where I am and where I need to be in terms of working on my own. If I know it will be five years before I can aggressively pursue my side hustle, what do I do in the meantime to prepare? Great, great question. So, Ofo, I, I oftentimes look at these particular situations as a bridge job. Right? When I left business school, um, I wanted to step into my company full time, but it wasn't ready to support me. And like babies, babies have to incubate in a womb for nine months. They don't just come out and they're just ready to run the world. In the same way, your ideas have to incubate. At the beginning, your ideas aren't going to command all of your energy. They're not going to command 40, 50, 60 hours a week. At the, it, there's going to only be so much that you can do to push it forward because it's going to take time to grow and to get legs under itself. Right? And so during this time, knowing that uh, when I left business school, I stepped into a bridge job. And the way I think about a bridge job is it's something that's going to be 18 months, right? It's going to be 18 months or, um, or I'm going to reach my six-month savings goal, right? So 18, bridge job is 18 months or six, for me, it was a six-month savings goal, savings, savings. I'm writing on the dry erase board for those of you who can't see me. And at the 17 month mark on January 9th, 2009, I actually reached my six month savings goal and I left my job um, despite the economic environment and it being uh, us entering one of the greatest recessions of all time. And the reason I did that is because I set a time limit. You know, oftentimes we're in jobs and because we don't have an end date in mind or something that's going to squeeze us out. Uh, and we kind of wait for the economy to drop us and us to get fired or something like that, uh, then we just kind of passively go through our work. So for me, I set up a deadline, and it sounds like you have this five-year deadline for yourself. And so when you have that deadline, what tends to happen is you know that because I have a, a specific space and time that I'm going to be here, I have to maximize the space. And so I need to grow my intellectual capital. I need to grow my social capital, I need to grow my personal capital, and I need to grow my financial capital while I'm here. Right? So when I was at my bridge job after business school, for the 17 months that I was there, I was growing my personal capital by going to workshops and trainings on the weekends and even conferences that they sent me to. I was growing my intellectual capital by getting more informed about the market. In fact, I found, in fact, that job was very parallel to what I do now. So it was helping me grow my intellectual capital just by being there. I was growing my social capital. Some of those students who I was working with at my past job ended up bringing me to their campuses later on. So I grew my social capital while I was there. And then, of course, because I had a six-month savings goal, I was growing my financial capital. So those are the four things that you need to be growing and developing during this five-year period. Um, and I think uh, the X factor for you given uh, what you want to do is going to be uh, your social capital and building relationships not only with uh, mentors and people who do what you do, but also building social capital with your future potential clients, right? So I hope that uh, helps Otho, and if you have a follow-up, please send it. Uh, Jody, 
says, in this program, do you address the best business structure for businesses in terms of sole proprietorship, LLC, etc., um, uh, in between staying as a sole proprietor or transitioning as an LLC? Has this program changed since you first launched it? I'll answer the first one first. So, Jody, um, actually, I, I pass all those questions on to my accountant. Um, and he's the one who has helped me structure my business. When I started off my business, I started off uh, in the wrong structure. <laughs> and um, I, he bumped into me a few years later, and he went and handled everything. He was on the phone with the IRS. He was filling out all the paperwork. Of course, I had to pay him for this. But now I have the structure that's best for my business in terms of tax purposes. Um, when you're thinking about your business structure, it's usually you're thinking about two things, liability and tax structure um, to minimize your tax, uh, tax liability. Um, and he will uh, um, educate you on that. So um, I'll pass that on to him. Uh, two, you said, has this program changed since you first launched it? If so, what have you added or improved since you first launched Be Paid? Uh, the biggest change that I said is I've actually um, transitioned or reversed the classroom, right? Again, you instead of uh, trying to do the work, the homework on your own, which is the hardest part of the program, you're actually going to be listening to the teachings on your own, and then we're going to be on the call, and we're going to be brainstorming. All of us are going to be on the call together, helping each other. Somebody is working through a worksheet. They ask a question. I help guide them through, and I coach them in that moment. And my coaching of them is going to help everybody else who's going through the same exact worksheet at that moment in time. That's the biggest change to the program. And every time I get a new insight about one of these nine modules, I integrate it into the audio. So you're going to download the audio for Be Paid um, uh, as soon as you register. But you know what? As we're going along over the next three weeks, I may get an insight. I may add it into the audio and, um, and ask you to download a new file. So this is a continually, a continuously evolving program as I find best practices for business. Um, the, your third question is, is the program right for a person who already has a business idea and a draft of a business plan for a proposed, uh, proposed coaching business but who needs help with launching, gaining clients, and building my brand? So, uh, Jody, I promised everybody on this call um, the opportunity to get um, – uh, one module for free, and I will send that to you tomorrow morning. Uh, I would like to send you the module on finding and selling clients. I think that that's going to uh, enrich your life. It's one thing to have a business plan. Here I have Google's business plan. This is actually Google's business plan, you see? And I modeled a lot of be paid off of some of the questions that uh, Google addressed in their business plan. And I got this from business school, right? The difference between this piece of paper and this packet and um, Google and, and actually Sergey Brand and Larry Page and Google is execution. And that's the difference between, uh, that's what BePaid is all about. So again, BePaid is business plan and implementation document. And implementation document. The implementation is where the gap is for a lot of people. And uh, through the program, I will help you identify your target market and um, figure out where to find them and what you need to do to go get in front of them. Um, a business plan doesn't uh, tell you that. You can document it in a business plan once you find the answers, but a business plan doesn't inherently tell you that. And so that's what we're going to be working through uh, throughout the program. Um, Marion asked, you touched on this briefly, but I would like to hear more about starting a business when you have no good ideas. Uh, that's somewhat of a question, um, but uh, for Marion, uh, what I would invite you to do is I would actually uh, have you have a piece of paper in your pocket and pen at all times. And anytime you see an idea or you see a problem out there in the world, I just want you to document. I want you to get through the habit, get in the habit of looking for problems in the world. You know, Biggie said, more money, more problems. <laughs> and I actually think it's the reverse. I think it's more problems, more money. Right? Problems are actually a good thing. Because the problems mean that there's an opportunity for us to create value. And if you just look around whatever room you're in right now, Mary, everything that you see in the room is connected to some multi-million dollar business. Whether it's the chair you're sitting in, it's a backpack, it's a vase, it's an exercise bike, it's a light bulb. There's multi-million dollar businesses connected to all those things. So there's ideas all around you. I just want you to walk through the world uh, over the next few days looking for ideas. Right, being intentional about looking for ideas, and by having a pen and paper in your pocket, it's going to change the way you've been navigating the world. Because some of the best ideas are right around you. All right. 
Um, in the program, we're going to help you identify your top skill, uh, the easiest one that's out there for you to monetize. Um, and we're not talking about the skill that you do for your employer. Oftentimes, that skill people are great at, but they actually hate doing it. Right? And that, that always sucks when you're great at something, but you hate doing it. We're actually going to find the skill that you love doing that is going to be the easiest to monetize. And I'll give you an example, and it, and it can be an obscure skill. So, Marion, if, uh, if I was your son and, um, and I came home from college and I said, you know what, I'm gonna I want to design food baskets for a living. Right? Designing food baskets is a skill, right? But if I told you I just spent all this money on college, but that's what I want to do for a living, you'd probably laugh at me as my parent. Right? You'd be like, I didn't invest all that money in college for that. But then if I came back five years later and said I own edible arrangements, then what would you say? You would say, I'm the best parent in the world, right? <laughs> so no matter how obscure your skill is, you can make a living doing it. It's, it's, just, it's just that simple. We just have to be creative. Uh, oftentimes, many of us want the sexy jobs or the sexy skills, but there are some bland skills out there that you could actually make a, a killing off of. Um, designing food baskets was something that people slept on, right? And edible arrangements came in and knocked out that market. Designing food baskets, that's a skill that somebody made multi-millions off of. And we're not even talking about multi-millions here. I'm not even a millionaire, right? I'm just teaching you what I know. I'm one step ahead of you guys, right? And I just want to teach you what I recently learned to help you catch up to me. Um, uh... Lanson, Lanson, Lanson said, how do you execute your side hustle flawlessly? <laughs> oh, man, I'm still learning that. I, Lanson, I am not flawless in terms of uh, the way I'm executing. Every day I make mistakes. Um, uh, the question is, are you documenting it? Are you learning from it? Uh, one thing that helps me is I get coaching. I actually have a coach. You know, If I'm going to coach you, I need to be getting coached. And that person helps me see my business in ways that I can't see it. Um, and they help me be more perfect than I am alone. Uh, your second question is, when do you know uh, you have relevant traction with your hustle? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, my college speaking business is in a space where it's starting to have relevant traction. And that's when leads are starting to naturally come to me. At first, I had to dig and claw and scrape in order to get a lead and, and to get on a phone with someone, but now they're starting to naturally come to me. Like I said, I went to this conference in San Diego, and um, and uh, when I was there, people would come up to me and they say, you're him. You're him. You're the guy from the TED Talk. And, and what was amazing was that some of them were already using the TED Talk in their classroom, and that was that just moved me. Because, you know, uh, it, it has about 50,000 views on YouTube, and I, I think it should have more. I, and to be honest, I'm not the best at social media marketing. But uh, what's beautiful is that they're in a classroom, and there's 300 people in the classroom. So, yeah, it's only getting one view at that time, but there are 300 people viewing it <laughs> at that time. So that's how I know that my speaking business is starting to get traction, and that's what's created space and freedom for me to start developing this business that I have right now. Um, how do you? I love this question. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip to your third, fourth question, Lanson, which is how do you value your free time? Uh, I just did the time value equation with you, and uh, let's just say I value my time at three hundred dollars per hour, right? Um, when uh, when I'm done with work and I'm and I'm I'm doing better to create boundaries around around my work. Um, I want to be a very present partner. I want to be a very present parent, and I haven't been the best at that. And I'm making intentional shifts this year to to do that. And creating more revenue through online businesses, through teaching online like this, is one way that I'm doing that. But how do I value my free time? Um, one, I try to outsource as much stuff as possible. One thing my wife and I outsource is laundry. Uh, we don't have a washer and dryer at home, um, and we outsource it. We just don't feel like uh, that's worth our time. Right? If it's going to take us two hours to go um, get to the laundry mat, wash the clothes, let them dry, etc., uh, and we value our time at $300, if somebody else can do it for us for $25, then we just outsource it. And so there is an exercise or a worksheet in Be Paid where we look at your time value, say $300 per hour, and say what are all the things that you're doing that actually aren't worth your time. Right? And from there, we figure out how do you automate that thing or outsource it. These are great questions, you guys. Um, uh, there's a few more, and feel free to keep adding. Um, so uh, 
We spoke after your presentation at oh, General Assembly. Uh, hi, Lena. How are you? <laughs> uh, I know who you are. You said you'd be interested to talk more. Um, yeah, we'll catch up, Lena. <laughs> Uh, and then Timothy, how do you overcome the fear of stepping out there, the fear of failure? Man, that's a big one, Timothy, and I want to send you module two uh, to listen to tomorrow morning during your commute or your lunch break. Um, one exercise in module two that we do, um, and Lena knows about this because we did it at, at General Assembly where I taught on, um, on Saturday. Uh, one module was going to be uh, writing your letter to fear. And so what I want you to think about, Timothy, is Think about fear or failure as a person. And I want you to write a letter to it, um, thinking about your past relationship to it, your current relationship to it, and what you want your relationship to it to be in the future. Think of it as an ex that you don't really want to see anymore, but you know that you need to reconcile that relationship. And literally, personify it. Start with dear failure or dear fear, and just write the letter. Write the letter. And once you start to see it as a human being and as a relationship, right? We have relationships not just to people. We have relationships to success. We have relationships to failure. We have relationships to success, um, to love. We have relationships to friendship. We have relationships to health. And some of these relationships are, are tenuous. And we need to manage those relationships in the same way that we manage our human relationships. So that's a great question. That's where I would start. Um, but I have a goal-setting methodology called the 30-day do it um, that will just make you fight and run straight through your fear. Um, and it's an event-based goal-setting methodology. And what I mean by that is that, uh, for instance, the reason I'm in front of you today is all because of email. My first workshop ever took place in my living room in Brooklyn. And um, what happened was it was November 10th, 2009. And no, 2008, and I wanted to start moving into this work because I knew my bridge job was running up and uh, I needed to start making moves. And so on November 10, 2008, I sent out an email uh, to 100 people in Brooklyn inviting 10 of them to come to my living room for an experience called Driving School for Life. And they, uh, three people responded right away. By the end of the day, the program was full. And here's the thing. Here's the catch, um, Timothy. When I sent out that email invitation, I had nothing planned for November 22nd, which was the date of the workshop. Nothing. And so over the next 12, now I have 10 people who are expecting to come to my living room in 12 days to find their life purpose, and I have nothing planned. What do I have to do? I have to show up. I have to show up. And so I will teach you these kind of goal-setting methodology to make sure that you continue to move forward because sometimes our worst enemy is ourself, and I'll help you work through that. So really quickly, um, I know some people have to go. I know we ran a little bit over. Um, and I just want to put it out there in terms of uh, the options for be paid. In terms of be paid, there are, this is what the calendar looks like. Um, the disks are actually the modules that uh, you will listen to um, during your commute or during your lunch break. And then these are the six calls on the 25th, 27th, 4th, 6th, 11th, and 13th. If you miss a call, uh, which I highly don't recommend, but if you have to miss a call, the recordings will be available so that you can catch up. And then when, we get, when we're done, well, we're not really done. This relationship is just the beginning. Uh, on the 13th, after that, you have a four-week challenge. And that four-week challenge is to make four figures in the next four weeks using the information and the positioning and the packaging that we came up with during be paid to make four figures in four weeks. That's to your challenge. That's your 30-day do it, like I talked about to Timothy, right? After the uh, after March 13th, you have 28 days to try to earn four figures. That's the goal. <laughs> All right. So, um, this the. This, you've already experienced the online platform. I told you about. Uh, I told you about the BPay. This is the uh, Facebook group where we just constantly inspire one another. But in terms of your options about the program, uh, you have a few options. There's uh, first and foremost, you get a buddy pass, right? So if you decide to take BPay, you get to split the tuition with a friend, um, or you can bring a friend for free. Let's say your friend is having a tough time, they're unemployed or something like that, and, and you want to help them, and you know they have amazing ideas, and you want to invest in them, then you can bring them along. Or if you have a friend who's a business partner or who's also a fellow hustler like you, you can split the tuition uh, together, right? Um, and th that will be your accountability partner during the program. Uh, you also get a 10-day money-back guarantee. 
So you will download the modules. We'll go through the first uh, three calls together, and uh, or basic, yeah, three calls together. And if you um, are just dissatisfied and don't like what you're experiencing, I'm more than happy to give you your money back. Uh, it's, just, it's no problem. I want people to be satisfied, and uh, I know that you're taking a risk by investing in the program, and you find out that it's not for you and you're not ready, um, then uh, uh, show me that you've done the exercises, that you've been on the calls, uh, and if you've done those things, then I'll give you your money back. And so there's three packages. There is the BPay, which is 360, and that's for the live, uh, the live six-hour sessions. Um, and lifetime access to the online platform and your business planning workbook um, and lifetime membership to our online community. Then there's Be Paid and Be Called, where it's the Be Paid program plus uh, a one-hour uh, call with me. And again, my coaching rate is $300 per hour, so you're basically saving uh, about 20% on my coaching. Um, and then there's Be Paid and Be Coached. And you actually get three sessions with me uh, for the thousand dollar package. So registration is going to close officially um, at 7 p.m. tomorrow. After that, I will not take anybody because I have to use that last two hours to get ready for our first call. Um, what I want you to do is email me at julian at sidehustle.com if you have any questions. And which module you want. If you if you're still uncertain about the program and you want to listen to a module tomorrow before uh, before you commit, um, just let me know which of the nine modules that you want. I'll say I happily send you that audio. You listen to it, see if you feel the vibe and the experience, and if it changes your life and your perception of business and the way you've been navigating it anyway. Um, and use that as a, a, a GPS or a decision making point for going to join us in this cycle of be paid. So with that, um, I want to take, I'm going to stay on the line. I know some of you have to go. We're getting uh, late right now. I'm going to stay on the line. I'm going to answer these other two questions that are um, in the uh, Google form. If there's anybody on the call line uh, who has a question, you can press star five to unmute yourself. But give me a second, and I'm going to uh, do these other two questions. Uh, if you have to go again, uh, feel free to go to bpay.me and register. You'll get your login information immediately, as well as the downloads to all 10 audio. If you still want to try it out and you just want the audio, uh, one audio file to listen to tomorrow, I'll send that to you. I hear somebody on the uh, call line. You have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what I teach in terms of uh, sales is, is it's actually connected to my interviewing process, right? And so um, in the sales process, I teach people how to ask their prospective buyer uh, questions that open them up to their not knowingness, right? And I'm going to break that down for you. We live in a world right now where everybody's trying to do it yourself, DIY. That's the term that's flying around. And so let's say you have a painting business and, you, um, and you're trying to paint people's homes, but they're like, you know what, I'm going to do it on my own, right? And so what you would do, uh, what I would teach you is how to ask them questions that open them up to what they don't know. So uh, you guys may have seen these kind of circles before where there is what you know, there's what you know you don't know, and then there's what you know you do, uh, what you don't know you don't know, and uh, I teach you to ask questions from this place because this exposes them to the larger. It, this exposes them to your expertise. The fact that you even know what question to ask here shows them that there's more to painting than just getting a roller or a brush and some paint and throwing it on the wall. If you really want it to look uh, quality, if you really want it to last, you ask them questions like. How many coats are you going to do? How are you going to treat the wall? Um, what kind of paint are you going to get? What kind of brush are you going to use? Do you know how long to let it dry? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these may sound like some basic questions, but to somebody who's never painted before, he's like, whoa, I didn't know I had to think about all that stuff. 
And as you're asking them these questions, they start to open up um, and realize that, you know what, it might just be easier for me to hire you. <laughs> um, so I actually teach that process, which is based on my interviewing practice uh, in regards to, um, in regards to uh, sales. That's my approach. That's what I've used, and that's what's been successful for me. So thank you for that question. Um, yes. Uh, where am I? Jody, again. Can you speak on the benefits of the coaching option that's included with the BPAY? So coaching is just one-on-one um, -on -one with me. Uh, the You can upgrade, uh, um, but you can only upgrade during the program. After the program is over, after the three weeks, then my coaching rate goes back up to uh, – it goes back up to three hundred dollars uh, per session. So a lot of people, some people wait. Um, uh, some people from last be paid cycle didn't want to do it in advance, and they ended up waiting. Some people were like, you know what? I'm going to need additional help. I know that now, and so I'm just going to invest in the coaching program now. And what I found is that when people invest in the coaching, what happens is since they know they're going to meet with me after, it it causes them to show up during the program in a higher way. <laughs> Right, because they know that they're gonna have to hit. They know that I'm gonna be looking through everything at the end of it. So it makes them perform at a higher level and really do everything thoroughly. So uh, that's one of the that's one of the best benefits of coaching. And then it's one on one with me, um, either in person via phone or via Skype. Um, I'll use your login. I'll go look at uh, your answers. We'll focus in on a particular aspect of your business. We can even use a dry erase board, and we can. We're just going to hash it out and go deep and and really try to figure out what's going to be what I call the fastest path to cash for you. The fastest path to cash. Um, Crystal says, I have a number of idea of potential businesses which are very in industry, um, capital needs. What's the best way to choose which project or business uh, to work on uh, for my first side hustle? So, Crystal, we have something called the Matchmaker in Module 1 uh, where we, uh, first and foremost, we want to build a business that's aligned with your, your lifestyle. So, first and foremost, we actually look at who you want to be and how you want to live. And then we find a business that's actually going to align with that. Um, and again, like I said, uh, what's going to be the fastest path to the cash for you? Uh, we're going to find the business that's actually the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and again, that might, might not be the final business. But again, everything is positioning. It's kind of like chess. We may be thinking five moves ahead. So we may start with this business and get that going and then parlay that into the business that you ultimately want that's going to have higher capital needs. right? Because um, if some of you have some businesses out there where you think you're going to need investors or whatnot, um, my challenge to you is going to be to use your side hustle as a proof point. right? So let's just say all of a sudden there's 1,000 people taking the BPAY program at once. Now I have a proof point and I can go get investors. Investors don't come to you uh, and give you capital until you've actually demonstrated and proved success. Those days are gone, right? You have to have proof points. Um, and so that's how I'd approach it, Crystal. Great question. Um, there's two more questions right now. Um, then we will probably wrap up. Uh, Lena said, I know you mostly talk about side hustles while on one has a job, but or what about a full hustle once you've decided to stop working where you are? Instead of 20%, well, what if one decides 100% dedicate a hustle? That, that's awesome. Where should one start, and do you recommend doing a side hustle to your personal hustle um, to financially support yourself, and what's in the balance? So I'm trying to – let me reread that. Where should one start, and do you recommend doing a side hustle to your personal hustle to financially support yourself, and what is the balance? Huh. Um, I'm trying to understand the question, Lena, uh, but I'm, I'm excited that you are ready to 100% commit. Um, I, want your, I want you to grow a sustainable business, and oftentimes what people do is they quit, they quit, their income goes down, and now they're in a space of scarcity. Right? And they have, uh, from that space of scarcity, it's hard to grow your business, and I was there. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't until I got um, my gratitude journal, which I use right here, uh, which I call my thank account, and I deposit, I deposit what I call millionaire moments in it every day, that I was able to get my mindset out of scarcity. Because what happens from scarcity, a space of scarcity, is that you start looking at everything, um, as, uh, everything as an expense. And my philosophy in business is that there's no such thing as an expense in a business. An expense in a business means that you shouldn't buy it. Um, 
everything you spend your money on in your business should be an investment, meaning that you expect to get some sort of return on it. If you're going to buy a camera, you're buying it because you expect to get some sort of return or you expect it to help you grow your business. So for me, and I'll teach you this, I don't see anything as an expense when it comes to your business. And so I want you to grow a business from the healthiest place possible. That's why I took a bridge job because I knew that my business was going to need me to invest in it um, financially, et cetera. So I had a six-month runway, right? And this was the healthiest place that I felt I could grow my business from. If I couldn't build my business in six months and get it to support me, then I needed to go back and find another bridge job, stack up a little bit more, and then go at it again, right? So that's how I approached it. Um, you don't want to... Uh, start your side hustle without enough resources to make it succeed. Because uh, what happens is it's not that your idea was bad, it was simply that you didn't give it enough life. And life comes in the form of all those various capitals. Now, a lot of people focus on financial capital as the number one source of capital that they need. The only reason that we really want financial capital is simply because uh, it's the most liquid form of capital. It's the easiest to convert to the others. If I have financial capital, I can buy my way into social networks. If I have financial capital, I can buy intellectual capital in the terms of market research. If I have financial capital, I can buy human capital in terms of assist, virtual assistance or Fiverr.com or employees, etc. And so it's really, but you all have the other six form, five forms of capital. And what I teach people to do is start with what you have, not with what you don't have. Because if we focus on what you don't have, then you don't move anywhere. And so, uh, Lena, I would, I, would, um, I would create a time boundary in the same way that I did with the bridge job um, when you feel like, you know what, I just need to go for it. Because it's going to be impossible to hold on to your old self and also get to your new self. At some point, you got to cut the umbilical cord and just go for it. And that's what I did on January 9, 2009. And here I am, uh, what, four years, <laughs> four years, five years later. Okay. Uh, and the final question of the evening goes to Kessa. I opened a professional service-based business, um, eyelash extension beauty for day-to-day -day clients. I then furthered my skills by gaining my, uh, what do you call it, esthetician license in skincare. How do I expand my business to corporate clients, commercial uh, print work, to charge more uh, for the same service in a larger platform? How do I better communicate my value without lowering my price list um, in this competitive market. Groupon is messing my game up. <laughs> That's a great question. It's a great question. So um, oftentimes when we're starting out, what tends to happen is that we start selling our services to our friends and our friends want the homie discount, right? And so automatically we're starting off um, uh, selling our services below their actual value. And so what's what you have to get um, comfortable or, or uncomfortable with is that your friends may not be your clients, and many of us have to start developing new social networks outside of what we've been doing for our business. There's your personal social network, which is the friends and the people you're comfortable with, etc., right? But they may not want your services. They may not need your services. So for you, Kessa, it would all be about how do I build relationships with the decision makers at these uh, companies that do commercials and print work, right? So for you, I would go to somebody like Global Hue um, and say, uh, you, do, uh, you do brand marketing for huge companies, and, um, and I know you do commercial work and print work all the time for them. So uh, for you, your relationships, I would go find 10 advertising agencies that have Fortune 500 clients and build relationships with the people there. So then you have to ask yourself, where do they spend their time? What kind of conferences do they go to? What kind of magazines do they read? Where do they hang out on the weekends or after work? Who do I know at those organizations already? And you need to build new relationships. Remember, social capital, I mean, financial capital comes at the intersection of your social and your intellectual capital, right? So people, the right people at those organizations, your social capital, have to know that you know a lot about something that they need, which is has to do with skin care and, um, and makeup for commercials and print work. And when those two things intersect, you are going to earn financial capital. If those two things don't intersect, you can be great at what you do, and they can be way over here, but you get no financial capital from it. So that's how I would approach that, and we would work together to identify where is do you need to be spending your time outside of the time you spend with your friends 
Where do you need to be building your business and social capital? I had to go fly to San Diego, which was great because um, the weather was great. I got out at the Northeast for a moment, but I had to go fly to San Diego to meet my customer. And I had to invest thousands of dollars just to get there and be there. Um, but that's what it takes. That was networking for my business, which is different than just networking uh, amongst friends. All right. So um, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, again, I would like, I invite you to email me at julian at sidehustler.com if you want a particular audio module to listen to tomorrow to help you make your decision. I would love to go on this journey with you. Um, you see the results that I've been able to create for other people who don't have MBAs, people who do have MBAs, but it's this basic business foundation that uh, will help you uh, scale uh, your business. I mean, my Stanford MBA costs $150,000, and um, be paid is simply a fraction of that, but it's condensed into a three-week period, and I'm continuously learning. You're going to be part of this community forever. Again, as I continue to learn new things, I, I always share that. Our community is um, inspirational. Once you get in that Facebook group, it'll give you new meaning and new purpose for even just going to Facebook. Um, and, uh, and I'm just here to support you. I want you to succeed. Um, that's why I do this work, and um, that's why I wanted to make it available to all people. Not everybody can afford an MBA. Not everybody has time to get an MBA. Not everybody can... Um, uh, uh, get admitted to MBA programs, but I believe that everyone should have this education, the ability to uh, turn their ideas into income, the, the ability to make a living doing what they love. Again, this is about your lifestyle design. This is about your business, personal, and individual development. Be, being paid financially is just a derivative or byproduct of the growth that you're going to experience through this program and beyond. So again, I want to say thank you so much. If you have any additional questions, Send them to me via email. I'm going to be up bright and early tomorrow. Uh, I promised everyone I would send those audio files at 5 a.m. so that you uh, have those for your commute. Um, that's going to be your experience with the BPAY program. You're going to have the audio files on your phone. You're going to listen to them during your commute and your lunch break. And then we're going to get on calls at 9 o'clock just like this, except we're going to be on the online platform filling in the worksheets. And at the end of the day, you're going to come out with not oh, you're going to come out with clarity, number one. Um, you're going to come out with your business plan, you're going to come out with your implementation document, and you're just going to come out with a whole uh, another level of energy and hustle um, once I initiate that four-week um, four four-figure challenge. So uh, I hope that you join me. I believe in you. I believe that you're more valuable than you ever even imagined, and I want to show you how to uh, manifest that and capture some of that and bring some of the amazing ideas that you have into the world. So thank you for being here. I wish you the best on your journey, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Have a good one, everyone. Good night. Peace.